Excellencies, colleagues, friends, good morning and welcome to the fourth annual Sporting Chance Forum. We're honored to be partnering in hosting this year's event with the UN Office in Geneva, the UN um, Human Rights Office and the Office of the High Commissioner and the International Labor Organization, the ILO, during their centennial year. To kick us off, as is custom and protocol, since we are in the UN, uh, I would like to invite Tatiana Valovaya, Director General of UNOG. So basically, she's in charge of the UN in Geneva. Uh, to formally welcome all of you to the Palais des Nations and this important place. We're very proud to be in the Council Chamber of UN Human Rights. This is a historic room with a lot of significance over the next few days. And so without further delay, hi, um, Director General, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Excellencies, High Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, dear friends. Welcome to Palais de Nation. And I think it's really emblematic that opening of the fourth annual Global Sporting Chance Forum is taking place in the Human Rights and Alliance of Civilization Room. And I am delighted to see so many of you here today. First of all, let me thank the co-organizers of the forum, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the International Labor Organization, and my sincere thanks go to the Center for Sport and Human Rights and especially to its Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Mary Harvey, for their dedication and tireless efforts to make this forum happen. I would also like to extend my very special recognition to Ms. Mary Robinson, Chair of the Center for Sport and Human Rights, whose dedicated tireless efforts over a number of years actually made this center possible. It is fitting that the forum is taking place during the week in which the world commemorates the 30th anniversary of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Universal Children's Day, which is celebrated each year on the 20th November since 1954, aims to promote international togetherness, awareness among children worldwide, and improve children's welfare. It coincides with the date uh, in 1989, when the Convention on the Rights of the Child was opened for signing. Today, 30 years later, the Convention is the most ratified human rights treaty. Since its creation, it has brought many changes in national legislation and has played a central role in improving the lives of children all over the world, from supporting their access to their basic rights to breaking barriers in economic disparities. This landmark date, however, is an opportunity to remind us that protection of children's rights all over the world is an ongoing fight. Unfortunately, the world of sport is not immune to human rights abuses, including sexual harassment and assault, and most of it sometimes go unreported and without remedy for the victims. We must work together with all stakeholders, such as sports governing bodies, host governments, international organizations, and human rights-focused NGOs, as well as sponsors and broadcasters of sports events, to make sure that everyone, children and adults alike, is protected from violence in sport. Ladies and gentlemen, in the often divided and fragmented world we are living in today, Sport remains an important connective tissue that binds people together, both across and within societies. Events such as the Olympic and Paralympic Games, the FIFA World Cup, and the UEFA Champions Leagues, we name just a few, are extraordinary moments in people's lives. Uh, and they are uniting nations together and creating new opportunities for cross-cultured communications. Let us remember, for example, the recent diplomatic momentum at the Winter Olympic Games when the North and South Korean athletes were marching together behind a common flag in the opening and closing ceremonies. Sport has once again proven to be an effective mechanism 
to break the impasse and get the countries not just talking, but working together. Besides its unique diplomatic power, sport is an important vehicle to teach young generations the lessons of leadership, good health, teamwork, fair play, and continuous self-improvement. Participation in sport activities can lead to better performance in school and better lives once students have graduated. Sport gives young people a chance to fulfill their dreams and unleash their potential to become who they want to be. Because the lessons they learn in sport stay with them for the whole of their life, and from that perspective, it is worth noting that the aim of the Sporting Chess Forum is to leverage collective action to tackle critical human rights challenges in the world of sports in order to enable young people to build relationships and learn skills that they need for being successful, confident, and responsible citizens. Athletes are not the only one benefiting from sport. For observers and fans, watching sporting events elicits a true inspiration, collective engagement, a respect for diversity. And for communities, sports can help increase economic prosperity, provide employment opportunities, and lead to significant urban development. From that perspective, sport is a powerful tool to achieve the agenda for sustainable development. As we're approaching the decade of action to achieve the SDGs, we need to join forces with all stakeholders in order to put sport at the service of the peaceful development of humanity. I very much hope that the diverse interactive formats of discussions envisaged by the organizers of the forum will help to further enhance the collaboration among various sports governing bodies, host governments, civil society organizations, and business communities with a view to make respect for human rights central to the world of the sport. Over the past years, the Sporting Chess Forum has already proven to be a powerful multi-stakeholder platform where the human rights attitudes in sport are not only being discussed, but practically tackled in every level. The work to protect human rights is never finished. This is why we all must be human rights defenders and do what we can to make rights and dignity a reality for all. I wish you a productive exchange of views and highly successful forum. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Director General. Uh, I have one correction to the interpretation. Español es cadena número cinco. So not uh, four, Spanish is on number five. The movement for sport and human rights is not new, but through concerted efforts over these past four years, inspired greatly by our chair, Mary Robinson, who will be with us tomorrow. All of us here are working to prove that complex challenges can be tackled with cooperation. And the potential for sport to promote human rights is only beginning to be untapped. The UN Human Rights Office and the International Labor Organization have been at the forefront of this work. They are founding organizations of the Center for Sport and Human Rights. It is only fitting that we welcome and give the floor to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Dr. Michel Bachelet, High Commissioner. Thank you, Mary. Excellencies, colleagues, friends. Is there any topic more passionately and widely shared than sports? Mega sporting events that gather the themes of nations and magnetize the attention of television viewers around the world. Impromptu games which come alive for millions of adults and children on dusty streets school playgrounds, beaches, almost everywhere. Sleek, professional competitions that focus the ambition of those of would-be athletes everywhere. These activities have the power to shape people's views. 
They can inspire generosity and respect for diversity, or they can be distorted by exclusion and prejudice. They can call on respect for the rule of law and codes of play, or catalyze violent rule breaking and corruption. Long after the ancient Olympics were established to allow for peaceful contests between opposing sides, we're still working to make sure that sports embody the values which build peaceful and respectful societies. There, has been, um, there have been strongly positive advances. The FIFA Women's World Cup in France this year, with its record one billion viewers, showcased the tremendous progress made in recognizing the contribution of women to sports. And although more work clearly needs to be done, to ensure full and equal access for women, including gender parity pay, I know that after four decades of prohibition, some women in Iran were allowed to attend a soccer ma uh, match last month. We have also witnessed a concerted efforts by the organizers of the 2020 World Cup in Qatar to improve a range of worker rights issues in cooperation with the ILO and other partners. And we're seeing that effort inspire positive moment on other aspects of human rights in the country. With the case of Hakim Al-Arabi and others, there are, have been many occasions where local, national, global sports figures are standing up for the human rights of refugees and migrants, whether on the world stage or in local communities. On the other hand, we're not seeing signs of diminishing racism in sport, particularly men's sports. Racial abuse is inflicted on football players in many Western European countries with shocking frequency. The racist speech and acts we saw at a major football event in Bulgaria last month were far from a unique occurrence. And alongside the openly voiced racism, many sports federations, including football, rugby, and hockey, are also reporting increased attacks on referees. It seems that just as we in the human rights community are increasingly reporting affront to and attacks on the basic shared principles of international human rights law, the world of sport is seeing manifestations of violent hatred and rule breaking. So we can and must do much better than this. Excellencies, sports like societies perform best when everyone is empowered to participate when everyone is given the opportunity to fully develop their skills and when the contributions of all are respected. The game is more thrilling, more joyful, and more inspiring when it is free of corruption and governed with principle and in transparency. It is also true both on the field and off it that we're strongly when we act together as a team. I'm encouraged by the work of the Center for Sports and Human Rights which has brought us all together for this important event and which is now firmly established under its CEO, Mary Harvey. I would like also to acknowledge the leadership of another Mary, my friend Mary Robinson, the center's chair, for encouraging us all to take action on this critical subject. The center's mission embodied in the Sporting Chance Principles is to drive collective action for human rights across the world of sport. And my office has been involved with the center from the outset and alongside our colleagues from ILO, UNICEF, UNESCO, and many others, we remain engaged and supportive of the center as it moves forward in shaping constructive dialogue, advancing good practices, and contributing to stronger accountability throughout the world of sport. I encourage all involved in the center's continued efforts to bring together more states and other stakeholders from diverse geographies its mission can only be fully realized if it's developed and implemented with involvement from the broadest possible range of actors. I am pleased that at this year's annual Sporting Chance Forum, many new actors are joining the dialogue on the links between sport and human rights. Our discussion will focus on practical actions by sport bodies in line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. That includes developing access to effective remedies for victims of sports-related human rights abuses. Like every other business actor, sporting events and other sponsors have a responsibility to uphold human rights, including with respect to workers, athletes, fans, and the local communities in areas, in areas where sport facilities are located. As has been mentioned by the director of 
you know, this week marks the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that yesterday we were commemorating. And I will be following with interest your discussions in ways that children can be safeguarded from human rights abuses linked to sport and how children's voices can be heard on all the issues addressed during the forum. Finally, we need to scale up our efforts to achieve the chair goal of ensuring that sports, wherever they are played, inspire joy and empowerment through fairness, equal opportunities, and respect for human rights. Thank you so much, and I wish you a very um, fruitful session. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner. That was inspiring. Guy Ryder, the Director General of the ILO, sends his regrets for not being able to be with us here today. He is traveling. But he spoke at our forum here in Geneva two years ago, and also at the launch, the official launch of the center last summer. I'm grateful for his leadership and that of his ILO colleagues, and we're grateful that they are also one of our co-hosts for this year's forum here at the UN. Guy Ryder has shared a video message which we would like to now share with you. Director General of UNOC, Tatania Valovaya, hi, actually, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. The ILO is delighted to co host with UNOG and the OHCHR the 2019 session of the Sporting Chance Forum. We have an impressive and forward-looking agenda that looks at the role that sport can play in respecting human rights, how to provide access to a remedy for abuses and violations of human rights related to sport, and how corporate partners can bolster support and respect for human rights in sport. And these are central questions that are facing sport today. And so the next two days offer an invaluable opportunity to advance what is our shared agenda. Colleagues, 2019 is the year of the ILO centenary, and while celebrating our past, we've also been looking closely at how we can shape a future of work that meets the challenges of climate change, of globalization, of demographic shifts, and of the fourth industrial revolution, amongst many others. And in June this year, the International Labour Conference adopted a centenary declaration for the future of work that charts a course for the next century to fulfill the ILO's mandate of social justice. And in this same spirit and linked to the future of work, we may well ask ourselves, what is the future of sport? Already in the lifetime of the ILO, we have seen how sport has in many instances been transformed from being a respite from work to actually being itself through professionalization and commercialization work with all of that implies for the protection of human rights. The Center for Sport and Human Rights can help shape a sustainable future for sport, one in which the rights of athletes, workers, communities, fans, volunteers, and journalists are all fully respected. That's a world free of child and forced labor. It's a world where sport value chains, including sports equipment infrastructure and services, comply with decent work principles and standards. The ILO can contribute to the future of sport, I think, in several ways. Last June, our International Labour Conference adopted Convention Number 190 on violence and harassment at work, and the wide scope of this convention makes it an important means to strengthen protection against violence and harassment in the world of sport as well. Then next January, the ILO will host a global dialogue forum on decent work in the world of sport. And your discussions today and tomorrow will inform that forum. And in turn, the forum will contribute to our joint efforts to make sport safer and more inclusive. And in Qatar, for example, the ILO has been working intensively with the authorities there to improve working conditions and to promote workers' rights for migrant workers in particular. And the ILO is thus assisting the government of Qatar to fulfill its international obligations for the 2022 World Cup and beyond. 
and important strides have been made this year. For example, in introducing a non-discriminatory minimum wage, abolishing exit permits, and ending the kafala system of sponsorship once and for all. Colleagues, in 2015, the mega sporting events platform made a commitment, commitment to the world with the sporting chance principles. A promise that each participating organization would draw on our respective mandates and expertise to support the platform in its development into a self-sustaining center. And four years later, we've made good on that promise. The Center for Sport and Human Rights is on solid ground. So congratulations are in order, and I want to recognize the exceptional leadership of Mary Robinson, John Morrison and his team at IHRB, and the CEO of the Center, Mary Harvey, and all of their tireless work to make this happen. The diversity of the stakeholders involved is, I think, perhaps our greatest asset, as the efforts of our individual organizations dovetail with the work of the Center. And as it develops, the Center must not only expand its outreach to sports governing bodies and continue to bring governments together, but ensure as well a strong role for workers and employers' organizations. Colleagues, we look to the future more convinced than ever that this is the moment, the moment to move forward collectively in our shared objective of delivering on the sporting chance principles. So thank you and the very best of luck in your deliberations. Thank you, Guy Ryder. Our next speaker, Jeffrey Schlagenhoff, the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. Mr. Schlagenhoff, I know this is your first Sporting Chance Forum. We welcome you. We have a long valued cooperation with the OECD in this work across issues such as access to remedy, a critically important part of our work, anti-corruption and sports integrity. We are delighted to welcome you and now give you the floor. Thank you, Mary, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here today for this important event, the fourth Sporting Chance Forum. The OECD is committed to the success of this event and of the Center for Sport and Human Rights. We've been a member of the Center's Advisory Council since the outset, and throughout our journey with the Center, um, we have seen the importance of collaborative work and collective action. At its best, sport teaches millions of people about values such as fair play, team spirit, respect for others, but also the importance of playing by the rules and having a level playing field. Mega sporting events involve high levels of public expenditure, large scale investment from sponsors, together with high value media contracts. This creates a high stakes, high risk environment for sports organizations whose operations are often subject to little external oversight. Because of this, the risk of corruption in human rights violations are elevated. Fighting violations of human rights and combating corruption go hand in hand. In the sporting context, this is a multifaceted challenge which requires cross-policy coordination and joint efforts by governments, companies, and sports organizations. This is precisely the goal of the OECD's work in addressing these challenges. On the anti-corruption front, the OECD, together with other international organizations, sports organizations, governments, and stakeholders, has established IPACs, the International Partnership Against Corruption in Sport. IPACs, to which the G20 countries have committed in the 2019-2021 G20 Anti-Corruption Action Plan, works towards better policies which can preempt a number of challenges in those areas where the risk of corruption is particularly high. These include procurement processes related to infrastructure, the selection of sporting event and event sites, and governance of sports organizations. Now, IPACS has also launched a new work stream promoting cooperation between sports organizations and law enforcement activities. 
On the remedy front, as was mentioned earlier, the OECD coordinates a network of non-judicial grievance mechanisms, the, the national contact points for responsible business contacts. NCPs are national implementing bodies for the OECD standard on responsible business conduct, the well-known OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. In that capacity, NCPs can receive cases against companies that have allegedly breached the guidelines and facilitate the search for a solution by the parties through mediation or conciliation. The mechanism is increasingly used in relation to sports-related cases. For example, in 2017, the Swiss NCP helped FIFA and the Global Union Federation Building and Woodworkers International reach an agreement regarding labor rights of workers employed on the World Cup Stadium construction sites in Qatar. NCPs are therefore a promising avenue to address sports-related RBC issues as evidenced by the regular addition of new cases, such as one currently before the NCP in the United Kingdom in relation to human rights impacts linked to Bahrainian sponsorship of an important horse race in English. On the local development front, in May 2018, the Council adopted the OECD recommendation on global events and local development. This recommendation applies to sporting events and sets the framework conditions to ensure that such events deliver on the promises they hold for host cities and nations. It contains concrete guidance for governments regarding planning, delivery, evaluation, governance, and partnerships with other actors. The recommendation promotes respect for human and labor rights throughout the event life cycle to ensure community benefit in the creation of quality jobs. The OECD has also developed a forward-looking implementation strategy to help cities and countries achieve more sustainable global events and build stronger capacities to leverage local benefits for all. Through its involvement at these various junctures, the OECD is firmly committed to helping sport organizations and sports industry develop best practices of integrity and sustainability. The OECD's membership in the Advisory Council of the Center for Sport and Human Rights is testament to this, as is, for example, the Memorandum of Understanding concluded in July this year by the OECD and the International Olympic Committee to reinforce collaboration in promoting ethics, integrity, and good governance, as well as peace and sustainable development in sport. In conclusion, we know that this is of paramount importance, that the world of sport is free from harm. The vision set out in the Sporting Chance Principles on Sport and Human Rights helps us make sure that we are all headed in the right direction. By working together in innovative ways, we can ensure that the world of sports matches up to its own core values. Congratulations, Mary, on the event, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Schlagenhoff. Our next speaker is known to many of you. I'm really excited to hear him speak. I've only seen him on YouTube. Um, he has been at the sharp end of sport and human rights um, as an athlete, as an advocate, and as a campaigner. Craig Foster is a former international footballer for the Socceroos, Australia. Uh, who earlier this year was active in leading the ultimately successful campaign to release the detained uh, football player Hakeem al -Arabi. We're so pleased that Hakeem is here. Welcome, sir. You are definitely among friends. Um, and I know that you will speak tomorrow alongside Craig, but I know there are some broader themes um, Craig, that you will address now to help frame our discussions over the next coming days. Craig, with honor, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Mary. Welcome all. 
and I'm delighted to see such an influential gathering from the highest levels of government and world sport and who've recognised the Sport and Human Rights offers a wonderful, exciting opportunity to live what we believe to be authentic in our bargain with the people of the world. Sport has, of course, convinced the world that we're a force for good, for positive change, for equality of opportunity and even for humanity itself. This promise exists in the statutes and vision statements of almost all sports in the Olympic movement, and it is in the acceptance of this offer in our social contract with global citizens that the goodwill on which all commercial growth exists. The most important people have accepted this vision, the athletes and fans. And accordingly, a vast global business has coalesced around these foundational concepts, representing almost 1% of the world's commerce, greater than a one trillion US dollar industry. Sport is truly a phenomenal business but I'm sure you agree that its unique nature means that it's so much more. In some fora, this commercial scale, power and contribution will be central to the discourse, but not this. In our gathering, we accept that sport exists to assist the people of the world to express themselves, to gain life opportunities, to learn to live in harmony together, to connect between all races, religions, genders, and any barrier so often used to divide. But these promises of opportunity can only be realised with basic protections for the rights of all. This collective bargain is the essence of sport, and this licence granted, this social capital which attracts such extraordinary commercial revenues, is purchased with the love of the people and of the world. People like Hakim al Arabi. He represents, in fact, the most vulnerable and important of our constituents, those whose lives are abused, whose rights are breached, whose contract with sport has been broken, obliterated, for whom sport becomes a tool for suppression, oppression and persecution. Hakim is the Afghanistan women's national football team. He is Sahar Koriyari. He is the US gymnast whose lives must be rebuilt from the ashes of sports failure to uphold our bargain to them, as must his. As you'll discover in the next few days, sport and human rights is a critically important and incredibly valuable field because it has given us all in sport the terminology to understand these harms, to respect our social contract, to prove that we're genuine in being a force for positive change. Organisations like the Centre for Sport and Human Rights are the vehicle through which sport gains its social legitimacy and becomes the positive force in the daily lives, experiences and achievements of billions of people. What an innovating, captivating opportunity we all have in this room to live up to our promises and to continue to be richly rewarded for so doing. This centre and others like the Sport and Rights Alliance, for example, provide sport with the tools, policies, strategies and foundational principles to live the slogans and vision statements, to honour all of our Hakims. Tomorrow he'll have an opportunity to tell his story, which is an important reminder that policy is not action, statutes are not commitment, merely the starting point. And we'll discuss the importance of not only putting the voice of every Hakim at the centre of sport's commitment to the rights of its people, to listen to affected groups and provide mechanisms for their voices to be heard and assimilated, but also enabling remedy and reparation, the next critical step. We've been reminded further in recent weeks in the football context, with which I'm most familiar, of this reality. The president of FIFA, Gianni Infantino, in awarding future Club World Cups to China in direct contravention of FIFA's statutory obligation to conduct a human rights audit, said that football does not exist to solve the problems of the world. This is of course true, but all of you in this room will have to decide, as FIFA appears to have done in China's case, whether sport is willing to potentially contribute to them, exacerbate them, or endorse them. It's most disappointing because of the very risks that Hakim took to protect the values of football, of which my colleagues have so passionately spoken already this morning, and that he believed in. The social contract that he signed with FIFA. 
for the game, for the world, was the agreement. In the 2016 elections, which was decided on so small a margin, Hakim lived his end of the bargain and spoke publicly of the torture he and other athletes faced in Bahrain and of the failure of governance that saw no support from the current president of the AFC at that time. Though human rights in part contributed to Infantino's success and despite subsequent statutory implementation, public statements and the positive glow of important and very welcome advancements made, incredibly the agreement stealed with Hakim's liberty was not upheld. Hakim's personal risk that he took for football resulted in 77 days of incarceration and imminent risk of greater physical harm, as well as damaging effects that continue today. The same risks taken by the US gymnasts who spoke out about their experience, and as you heard from the High Commissioner, the women of Iran, who lost one of their own, Sahar Kodayari. Sahar, in fact, believes so greatly in this contract for her rights to be upheld, since she read it in black and white in the sports statutes, that her personal risk proved tragic, as might have Hakim's without a global campaign. Recent advances in allowing women into stadiums in Iran are wonderful, incredibly powerful example of sports power to influence positive social change. But let us accept that it came too late and resolve to hold ourselves to higher standards in future. This forum is about collective action, shared learnings and collaboration, but we must accept that basic principles have to ground this discussion. Protections for people in sport are not discretionary because Sahar and Hakim demonstrate that lives depend on their adherence. And today, avoidance of this responsibility is fraught with immense reputational and commercial risk for sport. And with authoritarian regimes growing in influence around the world, and where the human rights of people are increasingly under threat everywhere, sport has a very real choice to make. Pretend there's no negative impact on participants and stakeholders and refuse to use the immense leverage that governing bodies and major sport institutions have with governments, or accept our responsibility to live up to the values that we espouse. The world urgently needs us all to do so. I congratulate you all for being here, and if further validation of your commitment to human rights in sport is required, I propose three powerful reasons for sport to adopt internationally recognised standards of human treatment and protection. It legitimises the social contract between us with your governments and commercial partners. Secondly, it mitigates the rapidly expanding risk that you face when conducting your sport business in regions of the world where human rights abuses take place and in sports zone operations, which led to so many major crises for sport. Good governance in 2020 dictates that you're well prepared for the crises that await the unprepared and those who continue to argue the long discredited theory of sports exceptionalism, as though we exist separate from society, from the human race, from the impacts that we create and at times endorse. We do not. And what's more, we told the world we stood for something for them. And thirdly, and most excitingly, human rights commitments and benchmarks provide a safe space for sport and all within, especially athletes, to advocate for human advancement, avoid the rapidly growing clash of values, and become a beacon for positive values in the world. The UN guiding principles, international conventions, and global standards are the bulwark against which sport and its participants must lean to provide protection against increasing commercial pressure to look away from human rights abuse, to avert our gaze from our own players and fans who, irrespective of the flag they carry, believed what we sold, and to be the force for good that we say we are. Perhaps in the end we might simply look at it this way. Human rights will ensure that all of our vision statements and slogans need not be reprinted and our bargain remade. I know that you'll prosper greatly from this outstanding conference featuring many of the world's foremost academics and highly respected practitioners, as will I. I heartily congratulate every step that the Centre, its advisory council, governments and sport has made in this field. Warmly welcome your interest and commitment to protecting every Hakim 
and look forward to seeing sport continue to live its public commitment to humanity, both for the game and far more importantly, for the world. Thank you.